Hi, I'm Kim Stanley Robinson, and I'm going to talk to you today about my new novel, Aurora. It's the story of a starship going to one of the nearby stars at Tau Ceti, which is about 12 light years from Earth. Now, the idea of humans going to the stars is an old idea. It's an ancient one, but in its modern form of actually doing it inside a spaceship, it's about 120 years old. And the, I think it was first uh, suggested by the Russian uh, rocket scientist, Silkowski. And his famous quote is, Earth is humanity's cradle, but you're not meant to stay in your cradle forever. And the notion is that uh, humanity over the course of its lifetime as a species would spread out through the galaxy from star to star. So my novel Aurora is the story of the first attempt. Going to another star might be way harder than was first envisioned a hundred years ago. You'd want to take along as many animals from Earth as you could fit in and as many um, in ecological zones so that you effectively had a kind of a Noah's Ark that included not just the animals, two of every kind, but actually many of every kind, and also the plants and the soil types. Uh, and that's a lot of material and there's a, essentially a contrasting pressures against you. You want the ship to be as heavy as possible to everything that you need. You at the same time want it to be as light as possible so that you can get it there and slow it down with a minimum amount of fuel. The problem is that the more weight that you take along with you, there's a proportionally higher amount of fuel necessary to slow you down when you get where you're going, um, not to mention starting in the first place. Now there's no question that there are a lot of Earth-like planets out there in this galaxy. The Kepler satellite and everything that we know about planetary science makes that pretty clear. Water is super common in the universe, rocky planets also. The combination of the two and a planet that's in the so-called Goldilocks zone, where it's not so close to the sun that it burns up, not so far from its uh, sun that it freezes. Uh, the Goldilocks zone is pretty broad and uh, life is very adaptable. So there, I think, are literally millions of potential planets that humans could live on in this galaxy. And so the Earth-like planets that we're finding, they could be 500, they could be 500,000 light years away. And so in effect, they're completely useless to us. We have to go for the ones that are super close if we're gonna be able to do it at all. And that means that they might not be as much like Earth as we would want to, to make life comfortable for uh, humans and other Earth creatures. Any star, including Alpha Centauri, Tau Ceti, and the other dozen or so that are that close to the Earth, in other words, within, and say, 10 light years or 15 light years, that's already uh, too far for us to easily get to. If the distance from the Sun to the Earth was reduced to one meter, then the distance from uh, the Sun to Tau Ceti would still be 800 kilometers. So sending uh, humans to uh, even a nearby star is going to be a multi-generational effort. If you get your starship going to one-tenth of the speed of light, which is extraordinarily fast, and we can't really expect to go faster and still be able to slow down, then it would still take you 150 to 200 years to get to Tau Ceti, which is only 12 light years away. So this is going to be a crowded little ship and it's going to have to function on its own with no possibility of help or repair for up to, say, 200 years. To get there, you would have to send a fully functioning society that maybe uh, could include, say, 2,000 people. But at that point, you, you begin to realize that every one of those 2,000 people is going to have to be a, a really uh, accomplished and contributing member of society. And there's going to have to be doctors and dentists and people who can repair the ship and people who can understand the ship's uh, computer systems, so on and so forth. And they're going to have to also be teachers, training the next generations to do what they've done because it would be multi-generations. There would probably be five, six, seven generations of people living inside this structure before they got to the new planet. They're going to be born in this ship, told what life is about, and die on the ship without even ever getting to the planetary destination. When you arrive at an Earth analog, it's going to have water, it's going to have an atmosphere, its temperatures are going to be within the human range, otherwise you wouldn't go there in the first place. While they're still in orbit, they'll send down robot probes and they'll try to check out the atmosphere in some detail. Are there any poisons in the atmosphere that aren't on Earth that they were going to have to look out for? That'll have to be tested. But there are forms of life that, even on Earth, 
because we can barely tell if these little things are alive or dead. The archaea, the bacteria that live in the basement uh, of cracks of the Earth's surface, these are so small and they live at such a slow pace that it's difficult to tell whether they are living or not. With aliens, they're likely to be equally tiny and equally difficult to determine whether they're living or not. So what you get is a question when you get to this new planet. Is it alive or is it dead? If it's alive, you've got a terrible problem because then um, it is very possible that this alien life form will be not good for you and you not good for it. In other words, the planet could be poisonous. If the planet is dead and just a, a, a dead lump of rock and water with the right elements, then that's much more promising, but you've still got a problem. You've got to terraform that planet. You've got to introduce all of your life forms from your starship onto that planet and allow them to spread on the new surface before it can become a friendly place for you. And until then, you're even on the surface of the planet, you're going to be living indoors inside uh, protected compartments waiting for um, life to spring forth on that planet. There is a kind of Goldilocks planet that would be almost exactly like Earth and yet have nothing alive on it, which uh, may be unusual because life may be very widespread in the universe and everywhere you get the right chemicals for it and the right temperatures, you're going to have life of one form or another. But say you do get a Goldilocks planet that is an Earth twin that is also dead, then uh, it, it could be the best situation of all what I've done in Aurora is to postulate that one of the big planets we've already found circling Tau Ceti has a moon that is about the size of Earth and has water on it. It's completely possible and it's the only way to go if you want to use Tau Ceti as your target star because we've determined that the planets that are circling it, we know of at least six, are massive, like five to six times the mass of Earth, and so humans would be crushed on those planets. But if there was a moon about the size of the Earth uh, orbiting one of those planets, which could easily be true even from our determinations right now, then that would be the place to head for. So I have postulated that there is a moon of one of the big planets circling Tau Ceti, and named it Aurora because this is the name that Isaac Asimov gave to uh, his planet in his novel The Naked Sun from the 1950s. And Aurora is an Earth analog, a watery planet with um, some islands, big islands, and the right temperatures so that it's a little colder than Earth but not frozen over. And this is the target destination for my um, travelers from Earth. And the kind of science fiction that I write, the way that I think of my projects, is to try to imagine from the old science fiction ideas, which are so powerful and so uh, compelling to our imaginations, what it would be like if we really tried it. And that's what Aurora attempts to describe.